Hello children. Today we are going to start with viral diseases. We completed bacterial diseases. We pass on to the next pathogen which are the viruses and the diseases caused by these viruses are known as viral diseases. Let us first discuss common cold. The name of the disease is common cold. I am sure each and every one of us have developed a common cold during our lifetime. There is absolutely 100% chance that we have got this particular disease. Meaning, common cold is one of the most infectious diseases. Let us see more details about this disease. The causative organism for common cold is rhinovirus and the mode of transmission is droplet infection. We already know what droplet infection is. Aerosols released from a patient either through sneezing, coughing or spitting which may be carried through air and cause a direct infection to a healthy person is known as aerosol infection. Other than direct infection, there are other ways by which common cold is transmitted from one person to another through inanimate objects. If a healthy individual comes in contact with an inanimate object which is already contaminated with the virus, then there is an indirect method of transmission of the disease. For example, certain inanimate objects like books. Suppose a common person with common cold hands over a book to you, there are chances of you developing the disease. In case you happen to touch the book and touch your uh, face, there is a possibility of developing the disease. So books, toys, mobile phones, ATM counters, doorknobs, pens, paper, computer keyboards, computer mouses are all inanimate objects capable of spreading this disease indirectly. Such a method of transmission is known as fomite borne infection. So aerosol borne infection, airborne infection and fomite borne infection are the three methods by which this disease is transmitted from one person to another. now discuss about the incubation period. Probably one or two days after infection, the patient starts showing the symptoms. Now let us discuss about the symptoms of common cold. I am sure you all know what are the symptoms of common cold. The symptoms are typically in the nasal tract as well as the respiratory tract but never in the lungs. The lungs are not affected during common cold. Only the nasal tract, probably the sinuses and the respiratory tract but not the lungs. So typically speaking the symptoms are the nasal congestion, nasal discharge, sore throat, Hoarseness of voice, the voice becomes hoarse, sneezing, coughing, in some cases watering of eye and general weakness are some common symptoms of common cold. Now, how long do these symptoms last? It may last for around 3 to 7 days depending upon the immunity of a person 
it lasts for 3 to 7 days. So we have learned about the mode of transmission as well as the symptoms. Passing on to cure. Being a viral disease, there is no cure and there is a very common saying by the doctors. You treat a common cold, it gets better in 7 days. Leave it untreated, it gets better in a week. Meaning, you just have no particular um, medicine for treating common cold. However, there are some methods by which you can relieve the you know, uh, discomfort of the patient like warm saline gargle, you can gargle, steam inhalation. All these are recommended when a person suffers from common cold. Even taking lime and honey can soothe the sore throat of a patient. But then whether you do it or not, it may last for 3 to 7 days. And Prevention definitely is better than cure. So, it is better to keep yourself isolated. Something that definitely does not happen as far as India is concerned. You have seen, even when you have a common cold, definitely your parents would say, doesn't matter, go to school. Now, that is how it transmits from one person to another. So, the safe way is to keep yourself away from a gathering. So, this is... These are the information about common cold. Let us now discuss about the next viral disease that is dengue fever. Dengue fever is also known as break bone fever. The reason being when a patient suffers from dengue fever, his joints develop terrible pain as if the bones are breaking. So that is why it is known as break bone fever. Now what is the causative organism for dengue fever? The causative organism is dengue virus and there are several mutated forms of dengue virus. So commonly there are categories of dengue viruses called as den v1, den v2, den v3 and then we four. So all these categories may cause dengue disease. So that's the name of the disease and the causative organs. The dengue virus belongs to family Flaviviridae and genus Flavivirus. You may recollect that common cold is caused by rhinovirus. Here it is caused by Flavivirus. So Flavi viridae family and genus Flavi virus. The incubation period for dengue is 3 to 14 days. So that is regarding the dengue fever. Mode of transmission. How is the disease transmitted from one person to another? There is a vector for transmitting this virus and the vector is the mosquito Aedes aegypti. This mosquito is found biting human beings. The female mosquito bites human beings either early morning or late in the evening. They are called as dawn dusk biters. They bite early and late in the evening. Another characteristic feature is they have typical white striations on their legs. So these are the two ways by which Aedes aegypti is identified. Dawn dusk biter and typical white markings on the leg. So the mode of transmission is the bite of an infected female Aedes aegypti mosquito. Let us now come on to the symptoms of the disease. The symptoms of the disease include 
the first symptom is sudden onset of very high temperature. Very high temperature is experienced by the patient. The second symptom is there is headache specifically behind the eyeball. The patient complains of headache behind the eyeball. The third symptom is appearance of a characteristic rash on the skin and the rash is very characteristic. It looks as if the skin is flushed, okay, reddish color with small islands of white. So it is typically described as white islands in a sea of red. That is a symptom and when you press the skin the redness does not disappear which indicates ruptured capillary just below the skin. I hope you have understood. So there is a typical skin rash where there is red color on the skin with white spots. Redness indicated by the redness indicating that there are broken capillaries below the skin. The next symptom is vomiting, diarrhea and liver enlargement. That is another very characteristic symptom. Vomiting, diarrhea and liver enlargement and a very typical symptom of dengue is as I told you earlier joint pains. Muscle and joints are in terrible pain. Almost all the muscles experience terrible pain. So these are some of the symptoms of dengue fever. Now, in certain proportion of uh, patients, the dengue fever changes into a much more fatal dengue hemorrhagic fever. So dengue fever is not very very fatal but dengue hemorrhagic fever is much more fatal. Now what is the reason? There are multifactorial reasons for dengue hemorrhagic fever. One reason is the flavivirus uh, inhibits the immune system of the patient. That is one reason but there are several reasons. Now let us see what are the typical symptoms of dengue hemorrhagic fever. In dengue hemorrhagic fever, there is, there is internal bleeding. When there is internal bleeding, the platelet count decreases. The blood platelet count decreases and there is blood plasma leakage. Blood is actually supposed to go through the blood vessels. But the blood, blood plasma leaks out and that causes accumulation of fluids especially in the chest as well as abdomen leading to low blood pressure in the human being in the patient which is known as dengue shock syndrome so what happens is internal bleeding leakage of plasma accumulation of this plasma fluid in the chest as well as the abdomen another certain other um, symptoms are there is severe internal bleeding, internal hemorrhage, especially of the gastrointestinal tract, which may be fatal as far as the patient is concerned. So, these are some of the uh, symptoms of dengue hemorrhagic fever. As I told you earlier, when the fluid starts accumulating, fluid accumulates in the chest and in the abdomen that amount of fluid is not there in the general circulation the blood is oozing out the plasma is oozing out and hence there is less fluid in circulation which deprives blood to the vital organs okay the vital organs like the kidney the heart all these are deprived of the normal blood supply 
and that can lead to dysfunctioning of these organs. Now all these cumulated together may cause fatality in the patient. Let us now pass on to the prevention and control of the dengue fever. We have always seen that the prevention is linked with the mode of transmission. How is the mode of transmission? Through the bite of an Aedes aegypti mosquito. So typically speaking, prevention and control revolves around controlling the vector or the mosquito. And how can it be done? One, by reducing the breeding sites of the mosquito, namely the stagnant waters. So whenever there is stagnation of water, the water sources have to be, uh, the stagnation has to be reduced. It is even said that small, small uh, coconut, uh, you know, husk, shells, small, small areas where there is water accumulating, even in our houses like the fridge trays or if we have an indoor plant growing, all these are favorite spots for a mosquito to breed. Suppose we have a cooler, there is a tray for water in the cooler. All these can, air cooler, all these can lead to uh, breeding of mosquitoes. So such stagnation of water has to be removed. Now suppose it is a large water body where you cannot remove the stagnation. Typically it can be controlled by introduction of fresh water fishes like guppies. Now you may have seen the film guppy where small small fishes are introduced into fresh water especially into the drains. Now when it is done what is the method? It is a bio controlled method where one biological organism is controlling another biological organism. How does it happen? These guppies can eat the larval form of the mosquitoes thereby bringing down the population of the mosquitoes. So that's the second way by which you can control the mosquito population. The third way is to protect ourselves from the bite of mosquitoes by fixing mosquito screens on the windows and the doors as we all, all, all of us are currently doing or to have mosquito nets when we sleep because as you know it is a dawn dusk biter or there are other ways that is by using mosquito repellents there are different types of repellents which are available in the market like in the form of creams in the form of liquidators in the form of fumes in the form of mats now all these come under different brand names and typically they all contain a repellent which can keep the mosquito away from biting us then Whenever there is an epidemic, normally what is done is spraying of insecticides like pyrethroids are normally sprayed or any other insecticides so that the mosquito population in the community is reduced. So these are some ways by which the disease can be prevented or controlled.